Great. Thanks <clears throat> for the introduction. Thank you for uh, the kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be here um, and give this uh, uh, joint mini course with Andreas and Stefan. Uh, so it will be about um, the composition theorem. So the goal of those joint lectures is to um, explain at least a, a sketch, give the main ideas involved in the proof of uh, a recent decomposition theorem or structure theorem um, for projective varieties with KLT singularities and first uh, zero first turn class. So at least conjecturally, those um, um, slightly singular varieties are, um, so conjecturally, these varieties should be uh, all the minimal models of manifolds, projective manifolds with uh, zero collider dimension. So so any, any manifold, projective manifold, um, with zero collateral dimension uh, should have a model that satisfies this. Okay, if you, if you assume the main conjectures from the minimal model program. Okay. Um, so, um, my, in, my, in my lectures, um, in these lectures, um, I will uh, essentially split them in three. Um, uh, the first part uh, will be devoted to give, uh, giving uh, some of the analytic tools um, that allow us to uh, somebody compose the tangent sheaf. Okay, so um, that will be a uh, main part of today. Okay, so the analytic tools, uh, essentially it's, first part will be about Yao's theorem. Um, okay, so maybe what I should have said is, um, so I'll, I'll spend most of my lectures explaining the smooth case, which has already important ideas for the singular case, and I'll explain uh, maybe in the last half hour or 45 minutes uh, what new ideas are needed um, for the singular case, at least in the infinitesimal setting. So the analytic tools uh, are yes theorem, a holonomy, th notion of holonomy, and then I'll mention the relation between these guys and the uh, stability. So that will be the first part, and uh, the second part will be a sketch of uh, the, pro, uh, the, the theorem in the smooth case, so due to Bovier and Bogomolov. So that's when X is smooth, even uh, killer, compact killer. And three, I'll give um, some uh, infinitesimal version of the, the theorem we're shooting for, uh, so decomposition of the tangent sheaf uh, in terms of metric data. So infinitesimal uh, metric decomposition. Okay, so that, that will be um, my, my three main guidelines. And from there on, um, so somehow we'll explain that the tangent sheaf, so that's in the single case. Okay, so I'll explain that the tangent sheaf is decomposed into a sum of a very uh, specific um, uh, subsheaves, um, and uh, those define foliations with zero slope, actually zero first turn class, and uh, they also satisfy some very strong stability condition, and um, uh, Andreas and Stefan will explain how to go from here to integrating those foliations and get a product decomposition, maybe on a cover of X. Okay, so that's that's the plan uh, of the lectures.
All right, so um, I wasn't sure exactly how much uh, detail I should have given, so uh, I made a few decisions. I hope that the experts are not too bored and that the, uh, it's not too fast for potential students. So um, let me start with uh, this, okay? So analytic tools. And as I was saying, the first part is uh, about Yao's theorem. So very briefly, um, so in everything that will follow, x will be a, at this point, just a complex manifold. And as the talk um, progresses, x will have more structure. It will be compact, Keller and with c1 equals 0. OK, so the first <clears throat> basic uh, definition is the one of a Keller metric. OK, so <laughs> most, most of you know that, but I'll briefly recall. A Keller metric, omega, is a closed <clears throat> one one form uh, that is positive. So what this means is uh, if locally you write, so any one one form you can write it as a sum of some coefficients, alpha, beta, bar, times, um, so against the basis of the space of one one forms. So you get a matrix, omega, alpha, beta, bar, and uh, I'm saying that it's positive is that that matrix that I get um, is uh, immersion definite positive. So the matrix, I want it to be definite positive. Positive definite. All right? So that's a Keller metric. So two, two conditions, positivity and closeness. All right, so once you turns out that the usual notion of rich curvature in that setting becomes very simple. And that's one of the, one of the many miracles of Kell geometry. And that um, also explains why Kell einstein theory is uh, so well developed compared to, uh, I mean, actually so powerful compared to uh, how much more difficult it is in the non kell setting is that the rich curvature of a Kell metric has a very uh, nice form. So I'll take that as a definition. Um, I hope it's not too misleading, but this will be convenient for me to use that shortcut. So if omega is a Keller metric, um, reach omega, I define it to be um, locally uh, minus i dd bar of the log of the determinant of that emission matrix. OK, so at this point, it's not clear at all that uh, this quantity is defined globally, uh, but if you if you change the coordinates here, obviously a matrix will change and the determinant will change. But a little bit of in algebra tells you that the way it changes is just there's a <clears throat> model squared of uh, the Jacobian that comes out, and the dd bar of the log of that is zero. So essentially, th this expression is insensitive to the choice of coordinates. So it's a well-defined um, closed form. It's only closed because it's locally closed, but closeness is a local condition. OK, so this is a well-defined uh, closed 1-1 one, one form. Okay, so in particular, it, has a, it defines a cohomology class in the H2. And another uh, great thing about this rich curvature is that that cohomology class does not depend on the choice of the metric. Okay, so the cohomology class uh, rich omega in H2. So this is a real form. Uh, it does not depend on omega.
and better, it coincides with um, C1 of x, which I prefer to see as negative C1 of the canonical bundle. All right, so that is. To put i over 2 pi. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I probably should do that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit lazy with two pies. Um, OK, so now that this is defined, uh, let me, um, so the, the, the main question is, OK, so this uh, guy belongs in this class. So question, if I take any element in that class, is it the rich curvature, like not as a class, but as a form? If I take any representative of this cohomology class, is it actually given by the rich curvature of a metric, calimetric. So that very uh, 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 simple fundamental question was raised by Calabi in the uh, late 50s, I believe. And it's known as the Calabi-Yau problem was solved by Yao in the late 70s. Um, <clears throat> and the answer is yes. Um, one way that I, uh, phrasing that's slightly more, uh, le slightly less general, but that will be more convenient for me, is to assume st straight away that this class is zero. Okay, so assume two things: that X is compact and Keller, so it admits a Keller metric, and with the zero first trend class. Uh, so. Th this class is zero. It means that any the Ricci form of any Keller metric is a DD bar exact. And the question is, can it be just zero? And the answer is yes. Uh, so given any Keller class alpha in the H11, there exists a unique Keller metric. which is richly flat. So not only uh, you can represent the element 0, the form 0 of that cohomology class by a Keller metric, but any com uh, Keller class, there is a representative, and that representative is unique. OK, so this is pretty uh, striking. Oops, not the right one. So, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it's only fair to give a few applications that I'm not going to detail, but so I'll go in length about uh, applications of that theorem to uh, the structure of varieties with C1 equals 0. So that will be the goal of these lectures. Uh, so certainly this is one of the applications. Uh, but this theorem and his uh, neighbors, uh, the negative curvature case by Aubin and Yao, uh, had a wonderful amount of, tremendous amount of applications in uh, complex analytic and algebraic geometry. Uh, so certainly. Uh, it's a crucial ingredient in the bovir bogomorov decomposition theorem. OK, but uh, many, many more applications uh, were derived from there. So some pretty straightforward, uh, like um, so the so-called Miauka, some improperly called Miauka yao inequality, because those are two different inequalities. Uh, plus, so the uniformization theorem telling you uh, if, when can you tell that a manifold is covered by either torus or uh, a ball only by looking at turn classes, so so-called uniformization theorems. Okay, and well, one. So the, the, the result here, uh, the techniques behind the, the proof of that result were also used in, more, in a somewhat deeper way um, 
more involved way um, for uh, the numerical characterization of uh, Calicon my domain bound. Okay, so I could go on um, for a long time, but let me just stop here. I just want to emphasize that this uh, theorem really somehow reshaped uh, complex geometry. Okay, so I'm going to stop here with the theorem. I'll get back to it a little bit later to let you digest it. Uh, and now I'll move on to uh, how I was saying earlier, the holonomy. The notion of holonomy uh, associated with a Riemannian metric. And eventually, I'll make the connection between all the notions involved here. So the autonomy um, is the autonomy is a group that you attach to any Riemannian manifold, and that somehow so it's a linear group, so it comes with a representation, a linear representation, and uh, it's a group that tells you a lot about the geometry of the manifold. Uh, in most cases, you can't compute it. So it doesn't tell you much because the geometry is too erratic. But in very symmetric cases, the homomy is uh, somehow smaller. And you get more invariance in the representation. And then you can deduce um, existence of very specific geometric objects. And that's where uh, it becomes uh, really useful. OK, so I'll state everything in the setting of Keller manifolds. Uh, so it's more consistent, but this is a notion that's way more general than that. OK, so uh, before I can define that, so again, let me take uh, x omega uh, Keller manifold. Um, maybe a base point, so connected. I need a base point, and d will be <coughs> the churn connection. So on Tx induced by omega. So you can see it um, as an operator uh, that takes smooth sections, so smooth vector fields, and you send them to endomorphisms. It's not a it's not a tensor, it's not a tensor. So, but if you take a, a vector field, then you have an endomorphism. So I'll use those notation. That's the derivative. You take V and you d differentiate V along the direction given by U. Okay. So that, that's uh, how I'm going to uh, see the connections in the following part of the lecture. Um, so once you have that, you also have a connection. So that's on Tx. But uh, everything is functorial, so D also induces connections on any tensor power of Tx. Okay, and I'll still denote that connection by D. Um, all right, so um, in order to define a holonomy, I need to explain what a parallel transport is. So I'll do that very briefly. The ID is. Uh, Quite simple. You have a vector at one point, so the point x, tangent vector, and uh, you give yourself a loop around x, based at x, and um, you want to have a, a unique way to somehow extend v along that loop that satisfies a natural PD. Okay, and so you follow that loop, you get a vector field on that loop, and eventually you come back to the initial point, and you get a potentially different vector. And that's why you get the parallel transport, the, the map that will send that vector to the new one. So let me formalize that. So if you uh, give yourself a tangent vector at x, and gamma a loop based at the point x, so there exists a unique v of t. Uh, which is uh, somehow a smooth section 
of gamma star of Tx. Okay, so V of T if is an element of this uh, vector space, right? X. It's gamma. You start from V. I'm saying that there exists a unique uh, tensor field uh, uh, V of t such that so you want to start from v, so v of 0 is v certainly and you want that the derivative of V of t along gamma maybe so really you pull back the connection uh, of uh, on Tx to uh, 0, 1 by gamma. That is the connection that I'm considering, and you want this to be 0. So you parallel transport uh, the vector v along that loop here. And um, v of 1, I define it to be tau gamma v. So because the connection is a Hermitian um, and the metric is scalar, the correspondence that sends v to v of 1, or the, the map to gamma, it's suddenly linear, but it's also an isometry, a complex isometry. So tau gamma um, uh, defines a, a linear isometry. of Txx. Okay, so now I'm going to look at all of those isometries for all loops. And I'll define that to be the holomy group. So hall of x omega, so I won't, I won't write the base point, it's implicit, is all the tau gamma for a gamma loop at x. And I want to see that, I want to fix an identification between Tx at the point x and Cn. So I, I want to see that inside the unitary group. Okay, so. Uh, and it contains a subgroup called the restricted holonomy, which is the, the group where you only consider loops that are homotopic to zero. So it turns out that, um, uh, well, a few remarks about those two groups. In the smooth case, it's not really a big deal to uh, consider like the, the difference between all and all zero, because uh, you have a, a yes, yeah, sure. Yes. So in that setting, they would be the same under the identifications between the complex tangent spaces and the... Say that again, I didn't hear. Yeah. It's a smooth loop, if that's your question. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, probably, yeah. Probably piecewise smooth enough. So this is a unique emission connection 
uh, that uh, preserve that is both unitary and torsion free. Okay, so a uh, few remarks is um, so let me. This is a bit long to write, so I'll use notation G whenever there's no possible confusion and G naught. And the first remark is uh, G naught actually. So those are linear groups, so they're uh, com equipped with uh, topology, and G naught turns out to be just the uh, uh, component of the identity of G. Okay, so G might have uh, infinitely many, uh, countably many uh, connected components, uh, but G naught is the least connected. And the difference between those two guys is actually measured by the uh, fundamental group of X. So there's a canonical surjection uh, from pi one to the group of connected components, or to the set of connected components of G. And so this might not be a Lie group. It might not be closed in general, uh, but Gina always, is always closed. And we have, so I'll go back to that later, but we have good classification theorems for uh, Gina whenever they're irreducible. So because they're unitary groups, so there's a, G acts on T X X or on C N, whatever you want to see it. That is a, a so unitary representation called the holonomy representation. And it plays a, gr a great role in this story. Um, and it's because it's unitary, it's semi-simple, so you can decompose it in you know, irreducible pieces and ask, okay, what's the link between that decomposition and maybe a decomposition of a tangent sheaf in uh, irreducible pieces in some sense. So I'll go back to that in the section about stability. Um, okay, so let's see. So what are invariant vectors of that representation or subspaces? Well, there's a natural map that goes from, um, so I'll write it with Tx, but any tensor would do the same job. Any tensor bundle would do the same job. If you start from, uh, a vector field that satisfies that its uh, covariant derivative is zero. So you take any vector, okay, so that means for all u, du sigma is zero. Uh, then certainly it's its own parallel transport. If you draw a loop, then sigma itself will be solution of that set of equations. And so sigma of one will just be sigma of zero because it's the same point. Okay, so when you take the evaluation map at x, you get a point sigma x that's in uh, Tx x invariant. And it turns out that it's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, it's pretty, it's pretty clear because if you have such a vector, so just one vector, uh, the tangent vector at x, that's invariant of the holonomy, uh, then you can somehow extend that vector um, to the whole x just by parallel transport and it will not depend on the loop, on the, the path you use from to connect x to any other point, uh, precisely because it's invariant uh, under the holonomy group. Okay, so invariant vectors of the holonomy representation are vectors that have zero covariant derivatives, so those are called uh, so parallel vectors. Now the, the vector space analog of that is, 
So you're wondering which vector subspaces of uh, the tangent space at x are stable under the holonomy action. Well, those are uh, all the somehow uh, complex subbundles of Tx that are stable under the connection. Okay, so F Tx complex bundle with uh, D of F, I include an F, so that means for all U and for all, so in Tx. And for all, uh, I don't know, V and F, D U V belongs to F. You take the evaluation map at X, and you get F X uh, in sorry, T X X, which is in the, uh, stable under G. Okay, and that you call the, the parallel bundle, parallel subbundle. So whenever it just means that whenever you take derivatives in any direction of um, tensors in F, well they stay in F. And that so that that's called the holonomy principle. This correspondence here, and uh, a simple remarks is uh, that extends to any uh, tensor bundle of the form uh, Tx uh, tensor P, Tx star, tensor Q with uh, integers P and Q, any one. If you replace Tx by E, and you have the same thing. Okay, the connection D, as I was saying, extends to a connection on E by uh, just uh, the tensor connection, and then uh, the holonomy representation, so it's a representation on Cn, and you can consider its tensor uh, powers. Okay, so you get a representation of a tensor power representation acting on that bundle. Okay, so um, now let me give what's the link between holomorphic stuff and parallel stuff. There's an easy direction. Being parallel is something that's not intrinsic. Being holomorphic does not depend on the choice of any metric. But if I take a complex subbundle, and I ask it to be parallel it, with respect to which metric. And so this is, some of this is a non-intrinsic notion that turns out to be stronger than uh, holomorphy in some sense. And the question is, we'll see that in the setting of um, manifolds with C1 equals zero, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And there's a really nice correspondence between holomorphic subbundles and with certain condition and um, parallel ones. So uh, the first uh, simple result, so so far I haven't used any compactness, I haven't used any uh, assumption on C1 of x. I won't hear in either, holomorphic versus parallel. Um, so one if Um, so let me call um, E, I take any tensor power of a tension bundle, and I look at a section of E, okay, so I take sigma and a smooth section of E, if D sigma is zero, so if sigma is parallel, then it's holomorphic. And omega and ekelometric. Okay, so being parallel with respect to any calometric when you are smooth section of a holomorphic bundle, 
uh, then implies uh, that you're actually holomorphic. And the reason is, is really simple. It's just that D, well, there's a one zero part that's now relevant for this question here, plus a D-bar D bar part, which is the zero one part. So if the whole operator applied to sigma equals zero, certainly D-bar itself applied to sigma is zero as well. So that tells you that the sigma is holomorphic. And if you play around uh, uh, with the same kind of game, if you have a complex subbundle, that is parallel. So if d of f is included in f, if d is parallel, then f is holomorphic. And better than that, and actually, we have a direct sum decomposition, e as f plus its orthogonal, which is a holomorphic decomposition. So if you have a parallel subbundle, it's holomorphic and its, uh, its uh, orthogonal complement is holomorphic as well. And uh, that sum is uh, holomorphic decomposition of the tangent or of any tensor bundle. OK, so it's kind of the proof is very similar. You look at the projection uh, from E to F orthogonal, and you check that the d-bar of that projection is 0. So now we want to have a converse. When is it true that holomorphic uh, tensors are parallel? When is it true that uh, holomorphic subbundles of the tangent, say, are parallel with respect to some metric? Well, it's not true in general, but um, it is true in uh, the setting that we're interested in. So uh, I'll, I'll set it, uh, I'll write it into, I'll first write the, the part about tensors and I'll, I'll move on to the bundle part a little bit later in 10 minutes. So now I need compactness and C1 equals zero and uh, Yau's theorem for the converse. So X, if X is compact Keller, with uh, C1 of x is 0, and I take any <coughs> omega be any uh, keller Ricci flat metric, <coughs> then any holomorphic tensor is parallel. with respect to Amiga. Um, OK, so we have a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between, OK, so a consequence. If you put together those two statements, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between holomorphic sections of E and parallel uh, vectors or parallel tensors and uh, invariant vectors under the holonomy action. Okay, so you've reduced the problem of finding holomorphic vectors to understanding invariance of some representation. So that's a problem of linear algebra as soon as you can determine what G is. Okay, so the proof of Bachner's principle is rather straightforward when you have the right tools. So when you have um, so-called Buckner's formula, so I won't prove it, but in this particular setting, it's, uh, it's certainly easy to derive. So the proof is you want to show that certain quantity is zero. Uh, so some Laplacian has to be involved somewhere. So you take the norm of sigma with respect of uh, your metric omega or the metric induced on E by omega, and you differentiate it using the omega Laplacian. That turns out to be the covariant derivative of sigma. I mean, the norm of it, square norm, plus something that involves Ricci, but Ricci is zero in this case. Um, 
So that's it. And then you, you integrate against the closed form omega to the n, and the integral of Laplacian is 0. Uh, and therefore, it tells you that this non-negative quantity integrates to 0, so it's 0 everywhere, not negative. OK, so that's the proof. So we want to have something like this for uh, bundles. So when, when do bundles come from, which holomorphic bundles come from uh, invariant subspaces? Um, so for me to explain that, um, let me move on to the third part about stability. So Carolina gave the definition of stability yesterday. Um, let me recall that very briefly. So in that setting, x compact Keller and alpha Keller class. And e, so I'll mostly use e to be uh, a bundle like that, so something with the zero C1. Um, it could be any bundle. Uh, so the slope, mu alpha, so E is alpha stable or semi stable if for any uh, proper non zero subsheaf of the sheaf of sections of E. And the slope uh, mu alpha of F, which is defined as uh, C1 of F times alpha n minus 1 divided by the rank of F is less uh, or less or equal, uh, less than the slope of E. So in my cases later, E will be a tensor bundle coming from a variety with C1 equals 0. So we'll have 0 slope. So in all my cases here, the, left, the right hand side will be 0. So that's the definition of stable, semi-stable. And the relevant notion here is uh, polystable. So there are two ways, equivalent ways to define that. Uh, it's polystable if either E is a sum of stable bundles and E is semi-stable. Or equivalently, uh, E is the sum of stable bundles, subbundles, with the same slope. All right, so. Why am I talking about this? Well, because. Yao's theorem has another application when you pair it to Kobayashi Ichin correspondence. As soon as you have a Kell Einstein metric, it induces a Hermit Einstein metric on the tangent uh, bundle. And therefore, uh, it's Hermit Einstein. Uh, yeah. And uh, therefore, uh, Tx is fully stable by the Kobayashi Ichin. Uh, the, easy direction of the Kobayashi Hitchin correspondence. Okay, so let me check that I'm not missing anything. Yes, so the theorem is the following. So X compact Keller with uh, C1 of X is zero. Alpha Keller class. And omega and alpha, the Ricci flat metric, given by Yao's theorem. Um, so then, 
So I write it with Tx, but any tensor power of uh, Tx would, uh, would do the same job. Tx uh, can be decomposed in the sum. So Tx is probably stable with respect to alpha. Uh, so, but we have much better than this. Uh, Ei as trivial, uh, so trivial first turn class. Um, okay, so not only against any alpha. Uh, Ei are uh, stable with respect to any alpha to alpha. Actually, EI do not depend on alpha. Uh, and this is, uh, so EI are parallel with respect to omega. This decomposition here, that's a canonical decomposition of the tangent into parallel stable subbundles and parallel with respect to uh, the Keller metric. So to state that, that theorem, I need uh, omega, and I need to fix a Keller class. But it turns out that the, that the composition is pretty much canonical. Um, OK, so I've got much better than uh, just stability, because I've got somehow unique representative. I've got a unique decomposition of EI into holomorphic stable uh, parallel subbundles. Right, so when you. So in particular, the homonomy representation preserves that decomposition, right? So the homonomy will uh, act uh, piece by piece. And so this is very important because eventually we're going to be able to determine what the homonomy representation is. So we're going to figure out what, so the homonomy will be a product. We'll know exactly which group happens here. And because of we'll know what the groups are, we'll know what the invariant vectors are. So we'll know exactly which holomorphic tensors exist and which one don't. And if at some point we're able to integrate the decomposition into a product, then uh, this is the end. This is uh, the bovier bogomer of decomposition, right? So this is somehow a, I'm not going to use that directly, at least not in the proof in the smooth case, but in the, in the, non, in the singular case, um, at, at this point, there's no way around going first through a, an infinitesimal decomposition of x. OK, so the proof, I'll mention it briefly, because uh, the scheme of proof generalizes somehow to the singular case. Um, so you want to show that if f is a sub, so OK, maybe tx is a sub bundle, let's say a sub bundle, then uh, its slope is uh, non-negative is non-positive, and if mu alpha of f is zero, then T x is uh, there's a holomorphic decomposition of uh, T x into f plus its orthogonal complement. That that result here will prove that. Okay, so. How do you do? Well, you use the non-intrinsic input that you have, is that you have a metric at hand. So omega induces a Hermitian metric, h on tx, and h restricted to f on f. And now you can use the usual uh, formulas, um, maybe due to Griffith, to compare the curvature of uh, the induced metric on f uh, with the one on tx. And when you do the computation, you find that the, the curvature, uh, so the curvature of f is less than the curvature of tx, right? That's the usual principle. Curvature uh, goes down when passing to uh, subbundles. But the, the precise form of that is, um, let me see. So. When I restrict to f, okay, tf, tx, so there's equality plus something negative, so I hope I write it in the good direction, that's beta star wedge beta, so that's the second fundamental form, so beta 
is a smooth section of omega 1, 0, x tensor ohm uh, f orthogonal f. Okay, there's a chance that I wrote it in the wrong order, but this, this quantity is, is non-positive. Uh, so, and so then I, I can wedge that with omega n minus 1. And when I wedge this with omega n minus 1, uh, because uh, Tx is Hermit-Einstein, this is 0. OK, I probably need to do this. OK, and then I can take the trace of that. Minus 1, and that's the trace as an endomorphism of beta star wedge beta wedge omega n minus 1. And now this is done. You integrate this. On x, if I integrate this part, the trace of the curvature gives me the metric and use on the determinant. So that's c1 of f times so omega to the n minus 1. So that's the slope of f up to a coefficient. And this quantity here is non-negative at any point, And it's 0 when you integrate it, if and only if uh, beta is 0. And beta 0 is exactly uh, the condition for the splitting here to be holomorphic, this smooth splitting here to be holomorphic. Right? This, that splitting is holomorphic if and only if uh, the uh, second fundamental form is 0 everywhere. So that, that gives you a proof of uh, the theorem. OK, so let me finish. With a corollary. OK, as I was saying, those now are parallel subbundles. So they're preserved by parallel transport. So that means that the holomere representation uh, fixes each, each of these subspaces when you look at the decomposition at the point x. OK, so that induces, if you want, Txx as a direct orthogonal sum of Eix. It's uh, into parallel. So, and those will be uh, uh, stable under G. So this tells you exactly when uh, Tx is stable. Tx is stable if and only if there's only one piece. And that's if and only if the holonomy representation is irreducible. OK, so the, the corollary that I want to get to is that in that setting, not really above, but um, Tx is alpha stable if and only if uh, the holonomy group is irreducible. Uh, their holonomy representation acts in an irreducible way. On Tx x. Okay, so this gives you a metric interpretation of stability for Tx, and that's uh, that's very useful, and that will be a, an important point in what follows. And just a remark, and I'll stop there. I've written everything in terms of Tx because it's maybe more. Uh, convenient, but it's important that this whole business works for any tensor bundle. So everything said here works if you replace Tx by uh, 
E. So E was a uh, tensor power. Okay, all these tensor powers have zero first turn class, and they're all stable. They're all poly stable with respect to any color class. And uh, each of those admits uh, orthogonal decomposition into parallel subbundles, stable with respect to that class. Okay, so uh, I'll stop here, and uh, tomorrow I'll uh, sketch from here the, the proof of uh, decomposition here in the smooth case, and I'll uh, tell a little bit about the single case. All right.